What's up, Eco Nerdlings? In this podcast, we're going to be examining biomes in detail. So we're going to be taking a look at the desert biomes as well as the coniferous forest biomes. So looking at this Earth's map of the major biomes, again, we're going to be looking at our desert areas as well as our coniferous forest areas. So as we talked about in our previous podcast, biomes rely on the climate. And depending on the climate, in terms of precipitation and temperature, we get different forms of life. So the forms of life that occur in very wet, hot areas are gonna have a lot more biodiversity. We're gonna have many, many different species of plants and animals. But as we decrease in temperature, as well as decrease in precipitation, we're going to get less biodiversity. When we have very low amounts of precipitation, we're going to start getting our desert biomes. Even if we have high climates, but low precipitation, we're still going to have a lower amount of biodiversity. So we're gonna begin with our deserts. Deserts have the lowest moisture levels of all biomes or ecosystems. Precipitation is very infrequent and it's also very unpredictable. And the lack of water in this biome is a huge limiting factor for plant growth. And if there's not a lot of plants, then we can't really support a lot of other types of life forms such as animals and decomposers. So looking at this climatograph right here, you can see the very, very low amounts of precipitation that we're getting. So January and December looks like we have the most amount of precipitation, but we're not even getting maybe like one centimeter, I would say. And then looking at our temperatures, this is in degrees Celsius. In the winter months, we're gonna have low temperatures that are almost at freezing level, but not quite. So we get about 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. And this is looking at a desert in Cairo, Egypt. Now, deserts in different places of the earth are obviously going to receive different amounts of rainfall and have different temperatures. So this is just one of many examples of a desert area. So looking at some of the main types of desert biomes, we have our tropical desert, we have our temperate desert, and we also have our polar desert. Obviously, our polar desert you're going to find in cooler areas. Our temperate desert, if you look, it's going to receive a little bit more rainfall than the other two. And then the tropical desert, you can see it gets very, very little rain, if any. So again, there's gonna be variations in annual temperature and precipitation in tropical, temperate versus cold deserts. So we have our subtropical deserts. These are usually located in the interior of the continents, far from any types of source of moisture. The wind patterns also prevent any moisture from collecting. So think about those uh, winds basically hitting the windward side of the mountain and not hitting the leeward side. The Sahara Desert in Africa and the Great Australian Desert are examples of subtropical deserts. And again, we talk about our rain shadow effect deserts. These are formed primarily due to their position on the leeward side of a large mountain. So that rainward side is going to get all, or the windward side is gonna get all of that rain and precipitation, so you'll see plant growth there but the leeward side doesn't get anything. One of the big examples of that would be the Gobi Desert, which falls on the leeward side of the Himalayan mountains. The Atacama Desert in Chile is the driest place on earth outside of Antarctica, which is considered to be the largest desert and the driest desert on earth as well. Some of the weather stations here at the Atacama Desert have never even recorded rainfall ever. So this is a coastal desert and the ocean water cools in the air so that it's unable to hold moisture well at all. The Andes Mountains form a rain shadow effect on the opposite side. So this is where we're looking right here. Here's the Andes Mountains and this is going to be our Atacama Desert. So at mid latitudes we get our temperate deserts and these fall in higher latitudes than the other ones. So they're in about 40 to 60 degrees. This means that they have much more temperature variability than the other deserts, and they actually get seasons in these deserts. The temperate deserts receive somewhat more precipitation than the subtropical deserts, and this helps them to support more plant life, which in turn supports more animal life. The Sonoran Desert in the southwestern United States is a prime example of a temperate desert. And many temperate deserts have plants that are called succulent meaning that they have that very thick, fleshy part for storing water. And if you touch it, it's almost waxy to the touch because it's trying to conserve as much water as possible. The succulent plants also grow extremely, extremely slowly. Big example of that would be our saguaro cactuses. 
It takes them 75 years just before they sprout their first on. And this would be a prime example of a case selective species, meaning that they have few offspring and it takes a very long time for them to grow and develop versus our R selective species, which have tons and tons of offspring that have a very, very rapid life, uh, life cycle or growth rate. And then we have our polar desert. These are consistently experiencing temperatures below the point of freezing. They have very little precipitation aside from snow and, and uh, ice. So they don't typically get actual liquid precipitation in the form of rain. Most of the interior of Antarctica is considered to be a polar desert. And sometimes cool things happen, if, if you think this is cool. But this is actually a 250-year-old mummified seal carcass that because of those temperatures was actually preserved for people to look at and get an idea of the type of animals that were existing there that many years ago. So next we're going to move into our forests. The forest biomes receive much more consistent precipitation than the desert biomes do, as well as the grasslands. And this allows them to support hardwood trees, as well as more biodiversity of plants and animals. So looking at the climatograph for a temperate deciduous forest in Germany, we're looking at our precipitation. They're getting uh, lower precipitation in January, February, March, April. Uh, May, June, you're getting a little bit more precipitation, almost 10 centimeters, probably I'd say maybe around 8 to 9 centimeters. Um, and then again, it tapers off in October, November. So looking at the climate here, in our winter months, we're getting pretty much to our freezing point. And then we're getting up to uh, maybe like 15 degrees Celsius. So it stays cool year round, but it doesn't stay at the freezing point year round. So we have a couple of major types of forests. We have our tropical rainforest, of course, which is the type of forest most everybody knows about. We have our temperate deciduous forests, and we have our polar evergreen coniferous forests, which we also call boreal forests, as well as the taiga. Now, of course, our tropical rainforest, as most of you already know, receives the most amount of rainfall and it has the highest temperatures. So we're going to start off talking about the taiga which is an evergreen coniferous forest, meaning cone-bearing trees. This one is going to be just south of the tundra, or the northern part of Northern America, and it covers about 11% of Earth's land. Its winters are very long, dry, and cold, and some places only have sunlight for six to eight hours a day. The summers are short and mild, and they have sunlight for sometimes up to 19 hours a day. We have our boreal forest, also called the taiga, these include forests that are found in very high elevations, and they're called high elevation islands of biodiversity because all of a sudden you have this increase in plant life and animal life. They often have very snow-covered peaks that reflect solar radiation, and as that radiation melts the snow, it gradually trickles down into the elevation through, through uh, streams and the ecosystems that give the plants and uh, animal life their water. So taiga are found throughout the far northern latitudes, and these forests are characterized by coniferous trees, which are much more well adapted to those long, cold, dry winters. They have those needle-shaped leaves, and that helps them to conserve water. And they also have that cone shape. That way, whenever it snows and all the snow starts to accumulate on the branches, instead of the branches breaking, the snow can fall off easily. So we have the evergreen, again, coniferous forest. And those all consist of our cone-bearing trees that keep their needles year-round. Well, I hope this was beneficial for you guys. If you would like to rewatch this video or any others for apes, you can do so on my website at www.nerdlingscience.com. Well, this is the Queen Nerdling signing off. Stay nerdy till next time.